we spoke about TikTok on this show, um, you know, in the ways that it seems like very handy that all of, you know, the pro-Palestine um, accounts are, are, you know, sort of lighting up TikTok at this time um, when the U.S. is trying to, like, suppress the amount of discussion of Palestinian human rights. And, oh, lo and behold, this bill gets picked up and passed by Congress to force a sale um, or at least passed by the House. But I think you and you had an interview, a great interview with Paris Marx, who's been on this show before on, on their podcast, um, Tech Won't Save Us. But about how that maybe is missing kind of the forest um, for the trees here and that the forest is really about um, maybe this broader tr kind of trade war with China on the one hand and then also what we need to do about data privacy on the other. So let's start with the the data privacy stuff, you know, like. Is there evidence that TikTok is worse than other social media apps when it comes to data harvesting and whatnot? Not necessarily, no. I mean, there have been some uh, whistleblower style accusations that perhaps you know, senior leadership at ByteDance or people connected to the Chinese government may have access to, to user data. And, and to be sure, um, but you know, some of that stuff remains a little murky. And, and to be sure, the Chinese government is authoritarian. You could call it a dictatorship. People have very few uh, personal or political rights there. And China probably does have ways in which to access the data that runs through Binance. On the other hand, um, almost anything you say about China as a surveillance state and its relationship with its tech sector can be said with some modification about the United States. Right. And while uh, ByteDance has made some efforts. They have, for example, they had this Project Texas thing in which basically they're keeping a lot of U.S. customer data on servers in Texas run by Oracle. Um, so there have been some efforts to kind of reassure politicians and consumers. Uh, I, I think you also have to ask, well, what are you afraid of? I mean, certainly you probably don't want the Chinese government knowing, uh, having, you know, at will access to, to 100 million Americans' phones if, if that's really the, the fear, the ultimate fear here. But then, you know, are, the U.S. government has the same. And are we planning on going to war with China? What is the sort of actual threat here or, or case that we're, we're really trying to stave off? And right. I don't really want them surveilling people en masse. But at the same time, this kind of move is, is almost an acceleration of that threat posture of saying, hey, we're, pro we're in a Cold War with China. We may very well go to war with them. So we have to keep them out of uh, U.S. markets by any means possible. Well, that's interesting because, I, I mean, it doesn't seem like we have hard evidence that chi the Chinese government is tracking us via by its holdings in ByteDance. You know, like like there's that ha that link hasn't yet been proven. And yet for American companies, we have proof that like the Zuckerbergs and the Facebooks have like contributed to, you know, um, crimes being committed against you know, like um, ethnic minorities in in or like you know um, in like Myanmar I believe it was or like Philippines or like being used by Duterte to like track people you know like all this kind of stuff the ways that um, Facebook and or Meta has collaborated with awful regimes to carry out heinous things against their own people um, anyway but yeah, yeah I, I think you know there's this also this question of why bite dan uh bite dance why, why um the TikTok in particular because the the law is proposed which hasn't been brought to a vote yet in, in the senate only names bite dance and um and TikTok. it but it leaves itself open to basically any company that either fulfills these certain thresholds or really that's deemed by the united states and by the president to be an adversary so you're really starting this new kind of, of sanction or war uh, against foreign companies at the whim and direction of the president. Yeah. The other thing I'd say is whatever TikTok is collecting, you know, people have Chinese apps on their phones, other ones. They might, you might also have just say like a, a ruler app or, or a voice recorder or something that you don't even know is Chinese, but maybe has like uh, an ad network beacon or something like that in it so that it, it is sending back some data about what you're doing to Chinese servers that perhaps could get to the Chinese government. I mean, we're really talking about a systemic, broad thing here. So TikTok is not special in that regard. And then on that, and I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to overstate the xenophobia case 
because I do think it is a very like I think what matters more is and and this again is no like yeah yay China the Chinese government but it kind of to I think some points you've been making is how does a trade war um, set a stage for a potential hot war and to say nothing of the fact that if we're really serious about climate change and if the Biden administration is serious about reining it in all roads lead through co co cooperation with China if we see that as an existential threat but at the same time Biden is super hell bent on painting China as are also our biggest ex existential threat so what are your thoughts on this sort of like broader trade war idea with China and how tech relates to it? And maybe thoughts on like the CHIPS Act, which I know some people have really heralded like, yay, national industry, this is good. But do you have another um, take on that? Well, I think one problem with the trade war, and we really are in a broad based trade war with China about tech and, and microchips. And the US has been trying to limit exports of key technologies and systems and, and really huge billion dollar deals between uh, all kinds of companies and China. But the question, the problem is, when does this end? And what is your end point, your goal? I mean, if we're all just sort of on the, econ on the capitalist treadmill of technological development, I mean, when are we going to be happy and say, okay, we've won this thing right. in, in some way that's useful? And the, other, and the issue also, as you suggest, is that eventually this could easily be a hot war. Um, so already you have a lot of China hawks talk about basically going to war over Taiwan, not because of something about Taiwan necessarily, but because of, of TSMC, the semiconductor manufacturer, which is indeed one of the most important companies in the world. But, you know, it, 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 it's just basically to defend that. Or even you've had some China hawks say, we should preemptively destroy TSMC, this company that is sort of the workshop of the world for digital electronics, so China can't get it or, or have, you know, it's, it's crazy kind of thinking. And because, TSMC, we were just on with David mm -hmm. Dan. Is that the same company that's like working to create uh, more microchips here in this country? Yeah. So that gets us to the Chips Act, which is that um, TSMC is exactly the kind of company of, that the U.S. would want to defend. But it's also one you want to n uh, nurture, perhaps, or help grow or, or partner with because it is seeking to expand into Germany and Japan and the U.S. and other places where, frankly, it kind of hedge its bets against a, catac a cataclysmic war surrounding Taiwan. Right. Um, so that I mean, I do. I think the Chips Act it has good and bad. You know, I think we really do need to invest in infrastructure and actually building stuff in an enormous way. And this is this is not something that works on venture capitalist timelines or budgets. This is like generational stuff where right. you have, and that's why sometimes you might have, to, or at least a government might think they have to give five billion dollars to Intel to get them to build a fab or a foundry in Arizona or something like that. Um, the economics of it, I, I, I do have some issues with at times, but I think the, the sort of broader goal of, hey, we need semiconductor manufacturing here in the US because it's good for the economy, it's good for jobs, and it's good for national security and also under, hopefully undermining the war machine and not sort of revving it up. Um, I, I, I see that all as, as moving sort of in the right direction. I, I guess I'm afraid, I worry about where is the money going and who are some of the people kind of benefiting or leading it. Someone like, like uh, Sam Altman from OpenAI, who's a little bit late to the party, but is trying to get into semiconductor manufacturing, I find a lot less trustworthy than Intel, which for all of its problems, like this is the business it's in. Right. And, it, and so if you, if you have oversight and give them a whole bunch of money, they can probably build some some factories in Arizona or upstate New York that will be there for a while. Right. Well, on that, just re before we move off of TikTok, I have two more questions on it. One is, like, what kind of bill should we actually be passing other, you know, beyond when it comes to our data, when it comes to surveillance? Um, obviously, <laughs> the House isn't going to do it. But if you were crafting one, what is that data privacy and safety bill look like for you? It would probably be a, n a number of smaller bills. I mean, I don't know what the political expediency calls for, whether any of this could Dream ever get passed. Dream big. Yeah, and then, and then yeah. Joe Manchin the, can pick it apart. Yeah, Although, the Jacob you know, Silverman privacy omnibus bill. I mean, we, <laughs> we need to, first, you need to stop the data trade here in the U.S. And this is something that uh, I've referenced Byron Tao's reporting, former Wall Street Journal guy who now has a new book out uh, about how basically the data brokers are tens of billions of dollars annual industry 
uh, here in the US, they're selling information about everything you do and consume and everywhere you go down to the most intimate details to all kinds of companies. <clears throat> Pardon me, including insurers and tech companies and ad networks and especially the US government, the Pentagon, the intelligence industry. So you need so laws to regulate that. the surveillance is still happening from the United States. They're, someone's just making a profit off of it, where it, China Absolutely. might circumvent it and be like, no, 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 you're not going to sell us back our, our, uh, this data. The U.S. is like, you can tell us back the data, we'll buy it. Yeah, and in China, they might say, hey, uh, we're going to order these companies to basically send us this stuff every month or give us a real-time feed because they can do that. But they might also use any number of cutouts or uh, make deals overseas to buy this kind of data. Right. Uh, because that is very much possible and certain, there's very little limitation on it. So you need kind of international measures also that, and you know mutual treaties and, and efforts to really manage the data trade internationally and talk about you know, what kind of stuff should be collected in the first place, what should be sold or should not be sold. And it can't be done company by company or even perhaps region by region because as I said, like, you know, TikTok isn't necessarily the only Chinese thing in your phone, if that's really what we're, we're worried about right now. Right. But you need to work, think more about these economies and these systems that, you know, this is the whole basis of, of, of how this stuff runs, is this kind of surveillance capitalist economy. So treat those kinds of issues more, and, you, and you'll have a more broad and I think useful approach, really. Surveillance capitalist economy is just so chilling to me. Um, and. I, uh, I I did want to ask because you have a forthcoming book, um, Gilded Rage, Elon Musk and the Radicalization of Silicon Valley, which I love. And, you know, you've written a lot about these tech moguls who are anything but libertarian um, when it comes to how they can use their money um, to influence the political system. Um, but just on that, you know, finally on TikTok, you know, one of those people who is, uh, I guess, a billionaire um, is Steve Mnuchin, who's like trying to put together like maybe some cohort to buy it. But then you also have Jeffrey Yass, who you've you've written about and you've talked about, um, who doesn't want TikTok to be sold because he's got um, shares in it or, or a large share of it. But like the way that our social media platforms, like I, I would rather have the fucking CCP have my data then Steve fucking Mnuchin, and for me, where all this came to a head, because people might be thinking, what's the big deal? Well, okay, what's the big, you've got Elon, you know, just sort of allowing anti-Semites to troll Jews on uh, Twitter uh, endlessly. But then on the other hand, you know, I feel like I had a psychic break around the Cambridge Analytica stuff with Steve Bannon and the amount of data that was used to psychograph the American uh, electorate in 2016, right, which we knew then had obviously was one of the contributing factors to Donald Trump's victory. That's a really long um, wind up to ask, how do we stop right wing billionaires from owning all of our like means of communication? It's just wildly, um, I don't know if it's undemocratic is the word, but just terrifying. Yeah, and I think at this point, a forced sale of TikTok would, would just send it into the hands of someone like Mnuchin or even Jeffrey Yass, the, he's the Susquehanna Group co-founder, financier guy, billionaire who t checks all the right wing boxes, who um, he probably doesn't want it sold uh, uh, as, a, as a force effort, but he could easily um, you know, step up his ownership stake when it is sold. And it is very frustrating that some of these same people are the ones who claim that they're defending free speech. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can take a very cursory look at anything Elon Musk has done in the last couple of years or his business record and understand that he doesn't care about free speech and, and X doesn't care about, about free speech. Um, you know, we, we still have the capability out there to have, um, you know, worker run companies and kind of more equ equitably, excuse me, equitably designed systems and, and economies of scale that don't work on the exploitation of consumer data. Um, I would hope that we move towards that in some way. I don't see any easy answer. Another reason why this frustrates me is because the Biden administration, I think one of the areas where it has done a pretty good job is antitrust and, right. and, and some of this consumer protection, breaking up companies, suing companies, and it's, it's messy, it doesn't always work, it takes, it takes a while, but you don't want just an, an, another billionaire to own this billion user company, TikTok, here in the US, 
without anything fundamental changing about how this industry is being run. Because as you said, right now, you just have kind of a new a new group of digital age Mur Rupert Murdoch's who um, who don't care at all about the common good or democracy or, or voting or, or our civil rights, which is basically what I'm writing about in this new book. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and lastly, I was just going to ask, like, for me, I mean, I, I would just say, like, the fact that Tr Biden is good on antitrust, again, offers this sliver of a window to wedge our pressure in, you know, and to actually exploit and to say, you know, keep going when it comes to like, actually, you know, taking Google to court. Um, tr like, let's, let's go, let's break them up. Um, but this for sale is just such a weird digression. It seems like moving backwards um, when it comes to all of that, especially, yeah, we don't know who might buy it. And God, Jeffrey, yes, who's you, mm. whose politics are just, just as heinous as any of these billionaires, you know, anti-union, um, pro charter school and all that, as you've talked about, it's just like, that's not a solution either. But isn't the answer, Jacob, just to tax these motherfuckers out yeah. of existence. Yes, I I think that's also perhaps the simplest one, really, right? Yeah, because you're gonna you're gonna reduce their power, you're gonna reduce their wealth, you're not gonna sort of pick at edge cases or or you know wait for one of these people to commit a heinous crime that you can prosecute. Right, and then you know I think one thing looming over this too is that. The government, I think, will and probably should have a say in how some of these industries develop. I mean, we have the Internet and a lot of the technologies that, that have resulted since because of government investment. But you want it to be done democratically and, and to move and, to, and you know, for the social and common good and to sort of move society in the right direction. So, you know, in that sense, forcing a sale of, of a quasi Chinese company to an American oligarch, not so good. <laughs> <laughs> putting some U.S. government dollars in, into uh, building manufacturing here may be a little bit better. And um, if, if you at the same time finally tax these people in a real way in which they don't have like nation state style resources, then we can do more of that, I think, more, more sort of CHIPS Act type building for everyone. What's going on, Frantifa? If you haven't already, subscribe to this channel right now. Hit that button. And also, you can become a patron and support the show every single week. Get access to bonus episodes and exclusive merchandise. Patreon.com slash Bituation Room. Do it.